angle of your library in there. All right. Now I hear you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Carl. Hello, everyone. Hey, uh, Ray, I'm going to try to uh, share screen with you. You know, do you know what to do on that end? Yeah, you you want to. I think you, part of what you want to do is is to make me a co-host so that I can share my screen. Okay, so advanced participant. Nope. I want to. Where do I make you a co-host? Do you know that? Um, maybe I, on maybe here. Uh, uh, make a, make a co-host. I'm going to do that now, or do you want me to wait? Oh, that, you can do it now. That'll be fine. Okay. I won't do anything to embarrass you. I there hope. You are. <laughs> and then I'm going to uh, admit Kurt and admit Lee. This is a lot of pressure on me, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing good. You're doing good. David's up. There's David. Okay. Let's see ya. All right. How are you doing, Kurt? Doing well. Good. How's everybody doing? Good. Great. Good to see you. <sighs> what What do we have so far? 14 up. Minus one for Charles having two. Two. <laughs> so, uh, we got two more minutes and see who else uh, logs on. Great. And you know we're re being recorded. Uh oh. <laughs> this is Keep going to the clean. CIA. Keep it, Keep it clean. That's going right. Good behavior. CIA is going to get a copy of this recording. <laughs> As long as I get a copy for the minutes. <laughs> Why are there two of you, Charles? Well, I do not have a webcam, so I use the telephone for the sound and the video. So I have the computer so I can see the screen big if, uh, to look at the slides but I have the cell phone for the audio. And You're gonna have to upgrade from that, uh, that 1920 uh, <laughs> computer you have there. Using the telegraph oh. there. Yeah. I've, I've, gotten, I've gotten a couple of these uh, scam emails where they, they claim they've attached to your webcam and they know what you've oh. been up to ah! and so forth oh and so on. <laughs> and, uh, I get a kick out of it because there's no webcam for them to connect to. <laughs> then they'll have to try better fishing than that. Kurt, uh, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you uh, you were in Chicago. And you did some uh, book hunting along Vincent Sterrett lines. Did you not? I did. I did. I, uh, I had a blog post a few years ago about a visit to Chicago and Powell's and picked up some Sterrett stuff and... Uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was a good trip, and and that was probably wow, that's probably five or six years ago now or more. Time flies. I read, I read it. I read your blog post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And about your very patient wife, I remember it well. Well, I'm glad to be on this because you and I have corresponded just a little bit, but uh, we've never we've never zoomed. So, yeah, about that. Yeah, there we go. Hey, tell me briefly, how do you pronounce his last name exactly? Vincent. Oh, boy. You know, heard, um, so... How do you do it? So folks folks who, who knew him, who uh, that I've talked to, say uh, Starrett. Okay. Um, but I also hear Starrett. And if you hear me talk enough, I'll probably use both. Okay. That makes me and feel better. And, and I, I, you know, I, I know some distant family members, and they said they've heard it both ways too. So I, okay. I don't think it really matters. Yeah. yeah. I've always wondered that because I've heard it different ways. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm done. I've, I've heard what I needed to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.
Charles, you can start anytime you want. Again, our guest speaker tonight, as uh, we've already met him, is Ray Betzner. He is uh, the author of a very interesting blog called Studies in. And um, read you a few words from that blog. First test twice at the age of 15. I finally passed a bench of the Carnegie Library. It was here on a lower shelf where the dust tended to collect that I found two books that would remain companions for the next four decades. The Complete Sherlock Holmes with an introduction by Christopher Morley, founder of the Baker Street Irregulars and The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes by Vincent Starrett. In this book, Starrett wrote about Sherlock Holmes in a loving fashion that was childlike without being childish. He also introduced me to the Baker Street Irregulars, a group of Sherlock Holmes devotees who gather each year in New York to celebrate Holmes' birth. It seemed impossible that the son of a steel worker could one day become a member. And yet, here I am all these many years later, happily bearing the Baker Street Irregulars Investiture, the Agony Column. Over the years, I have gathered up bits and pieces of Starrett in books and magazines. I created this blog to share these discoveries with that small but merry band of fellow Starrettians, which after today, I hope we will all be a part of. So without further ado, Ray Betts. Well, well, thank you, Charles. Thank you very much. Um, and first, let me let me start by uh, sending you my condolences on Jerry's death. Um, it was uh, hard news to hear, um, but one of the things that I've learned is the book collecting community um, is a very, very supportive one, and um, that strong friendships uh, are are built there. And um, so uh, I, I know it's it's always tough when when uh, we lose a friend uh, and, and a fellow collector. So um, I am going to attempt to share my screen with you um, and um, see if I can, well, that's not what I wanted. Right? Don't, don't panic, okay? That's the most important thing, don't panic yet. Let's try it again. That looks a little better. And um, can I ask everybody to put them on mute, ex uh, themselves on mute, except for Ray? And uh, everybody's picture won't be popping up if you put it on mute. I don't know how to do that. Um, up in the right hand corner of your uh, screen, it should be a uh, little microphone. Just click on it. Let me do it for you. Go ahead. Okay, Ray, I think you got it. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, want to also share sound from this and um, share computer sound. There you go. Hopefully that will work. All right, well, thank you very much and I appreciate your patience uh, with all of that. Um, so I'm gonna be using a couple of terms tonight. Um, you all probably can figure them out pretty easily, but just in case, let me go ahead and do it. Uh, the first term is Sherlockian. That's a Sherlock Holmes nut. I am a Sherlock Holmes nut. Uh, that generally refers to people who uh, spend a lot of time 
reading the original 60s Sherlock Holmes stories, often attributed to Arthur Conan Doyle, but we know better they were actually written by Dr. John Watson. Uh, the second uh, uh, term you might hear is the canon. Uh, that's the Sherlockian canon. That's the original 60s stories. Um, and the third is the Baker Street Irregulars. And that is a group you'll hear a little bit about that uh, Christopher Morley and Edgar W. Smith and Vincent Sterrett started back in the 1930s. It continues uh, through to today. So here we go. Um, I want to tell you a story. It's the story of a childhood fascination that became an adult obsession with books, a story of poetry and mystery and war and hope. And in the end, it's the story of friendship built around a mutual admiration for books and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. It's the story of Charles Vincent Emerson Sterrett. He was born in Toronto, Canada on October 26, 1886. Although his family moved to Chicago when he was a boy, Sterrett continued to summer in Toronto, giving him opportunities to roam the bookstore his grandfather ran with its room in the back devoted to children's books. Here's how he remembered uh, that experience many years later. My happiest recollections of books and reading were the hours I spent in Grandfather Young's bookshop in Toronto. My particular playground was at the back, a small room given over exclusively to children's books where on bright days, the sunlight fell through a back window in a warm blaze of friendliness, such as I have never experienced elsewhere. It is impossible to describe the radiance of that little room as the sunlight picked out the titles and the books and brought out the illustrations on their spines. Soldiers, horses, cowboys, Indians, gold diggers, frigates, ships in full sail and ships sinking beneath the waves. A stirring panorama of all the traditional scenes of peril and adventure. Sterrett would spend the rest of his life recreating that room and attempting to recapture that magical experience. It was Sterrett's aunts who introduced him to the Sherlock Holmes stories. Here's how he described the enchantment of reading his first Holmes book. I sat down with it on the front steps in a blaze of summer sunshine. My aunts came and went on the porch above me, but in the words of the old biblical writers, I heard them not. I was still reading Sterrett, uh, Sherlock Holmes when the lamps were lit inside the house and I was called in to dinner. Sterrett began collecting books as a boy and he never stopped. He left high school without graduating and he went to work on the fast paced Chicago newspapers of the 19 teens and 20s. He was also putting together an authoritative collections of Stephen Crane, Robert Louis Stevenson, Ambrose Bierce, Edgar Allan Poe, and the Welsh writer Arthur Macon. And then there was his Holmes work. Reedy's Mirror is today an obscure and largely forgotten Midwestern weekly, but in the early 1900s, it was an influential paper in the country's midsection. Starrett wrote several articles for Mr. Reedy, and in the February 22, 1918 issue, he wrote his first major piece about Sherlock Holmes. The occasion was the publication of the collection of Sherlock Holmes stories under the title His Last Bow. For Sterrett, this was not a book review, but a love letter. Quote, the advent of a new Sherlock Holmes book is a distinct literary event. Heaven alone knows how many millions of people from China to Peru breathed a delightful sigh at the word and hastened off to purchase the volume. It is very probable that Sherlock Holmes is the most popular single character in contemporary fiction. Certainly he is the only one who has passed into the language whose name has become a symbol by which all of his type and tribe are known. He also says of the Baker Street Sleuth, he is the transcendental detective par excellence, an authentic figure in the world's literature, a genuine and artistic creation. Sterrett was only saying publicly what he had been privately thinking and acting on for a while. We know that by 1917, when he was 31, he had already had one of the premier collections of Sherlock Holmes stories in the United States. That year, he wrote a letter to the editor of the bookman, asking for a copy of an article about Holmes that had run a few years before. I'm anxious to get the paper now, and I, I will be greatly obliged if you can help me to it. I'm trying to collect, as faithfully as may be, the literature of Sherlock Holmes, who is my favorite character in light fiction, 
and altogether a delightful creation. Ah. The literature of Sherlock Holmes. Sterrett was one of the first to recognize that there was a growing body of commentary that existed outside of the original stories that took a look at those stories as if they were real. That's a notion that seems common enough for us today, especially those of us who are Sherlockians, but it was still a new idea in 1917. Okay. And as we'll see, Sterrett was very much ahead of yeah. his time. Before passing on to the um, other Holmes stories, I, I do okay. want to spend a few moments uh, talking to you about uh, Sterrett's other work. Um, he was a short story writer first um, and um, produced a series of short stories about Jimmy Lavender, his version of Sherlock Vanessa, Holmes. Vanessa, can you get me a Diet Coke, please? Uh, I cannot get you a Diet Coke, sorry. Um, that, uh, his, that Jimmy Lavender was his version of Sherlock Holmes. Um, he lived in Chicago. He was a debonair detective. Uh, he had an assistant by the name of Gilly Gilruth, who was his kind of Dr. Watson. Those stories started in the 19-teens. Uh, when a, a new stories came up through the 1930s, um, and the, um, the first two are the pulps that a couple of them appeared in. Those other two on, on the right side, the Raven's Call and the Lisping Man, um, are actually syndicated articles that appeared in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s in American newspapers. He sold his stories over and over again, made some decent money out of it. He considered himself a poet first, and these are some of the books of his poetry. Um, he was an old romantic. Um, the, the photograph that you see there, he called his dying poets photo. He said dying poets often have a habit of becoming very famous and wealthy. Um, and uh, that's, that seemed to somehow elude him during the course of his lifetime. He was uh, pretty much a pauper uh, for most of his life because he spent too much money on books. His uh, most prolific period was in the 1930s uh, when he wrote these uh, mystery novels. Uh, and again, his sleuths were very intellectual, very much in the Sherlock Holmes vein. Um, and uh, as you'll hear a little bit later on, they were popular for their time. They've swiftly disappeared, uh, especially when the hard boiled school of detectives came in. For Christmas of 1920, Sterrett wrote a short story that used the conventions of a Sherlock Holmes mystery to gently mock the obsession of book collectors, like himself and perhaps like a few of us here. The story is called The Unique Hamlet and concerns the rarest Shakespearean portfolio in the world with a four-line inscription in the author's own hand. The book has been stolen and Sherlock Holmes is called in to find it. I won't spoil the plot. You can find it reproduced in a lot of different publications. And I think there are a couple of places where you can find it online. But I will tell you this, that Holmes manages to recover one page of the manuscript. When Watson asks him why he saved only a single page from Hamlet, Holmes explains, quote, a fancy to preserve so accurate a characterization of either of our book collecting friends. The line is a real jewel. See, the good Polonius says, that he is mad is true. Tis true, tis pity, and pity it is true. A little later, Sherlock Holmes says, they are strange people, these book collectors. While there's little dispute about it today, it appears that 110 copies of Unique Hamlet were printed. Today, copies of this little pamphlet are quite rare. When they come up for sale, the prices are handsome indeed, from 3,000 to up to $7,000. Um, if any of you have a copy of it and you want to get rid of it, give me a call later on. We'll talk. I'm not paying $7,000. You should know that. Starrett's book collecting continued through the 20s and 30s, which was also the period of his greatest output in fiction with several novels and dozens of short stories. One nonfiction piece is worth noting, coming as it did at the end of 1930. Arthur Conan Doyle had died in July of that year. And six months later, the Christmas issue of the Golden Book magazine published an essay by Sterrett entitled The Real Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. In it, Sterrett tells how Conan Doyle used Holmes-like methods to investigate two cases where innocent men had been charged with crimes. The uh, article from Golden Book magazine was extraordinarily popular. It was the first and only piece that was picked up by Reader's Digest uh, of Sterrett's. Um, and he started getting questions from others about Sherlock Holmes. He knew that he had kind of stumbled on a gold mine here. 
Sarah quickly drew up plans for a book along the same theme. Each chapter would be a freestanding essay with the essays linked together by the common theme of Sherlock Holmes as one of the world's great characters and cultural icons. He called it The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. The book was published in 1933 by Macmillan. While its revelations would not be surprising to any modern day Sherlockian, the fact is there were no Sherlockians in those days. In fact, it could be argued that Vincent Starrett helped create Sherlockians with the popularity of his single book. Very quickly, uh, this is a, a shelf of um, all of the various editions of the Sherlock Holmes stories. The 1933 edition is over there on the left-hand side of your screen with uh, uh, the uh, second uh, printing of 1934. Um, the one that has a Sherlock Holmes standing there with his uh, hand on his chin is the British edition from 1934. In 1960, Sterrett went and revised the book, and those are the two uh, variant dust jackets to the 1960 edition. Um, the uh, ones from uh, Baskel, ba um, Baskel House and um, AMS are two of the ugliest books ever published that Vincent Starrett ever wrote. They were done for libraries, they were done on the cheap, and they're really awful. But nonetheless, when you're a collector, you have to have them. Uh, the uh, Yellow Private Life of Sherlock Holmes is the British edition of the 1960s. And those are various other editions that go along. The one that you cannot see uh, on the various on the very right hand side of the screen is the 75th anniversary edition of the Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. I include that because I edited it, and it's my ego that allows me to do that. Some of Starrett's essays played the game and treated Holmes as a living, breathing person. Others discussed Arthur Conan Doyle and his relationship to the great detective. There were chapters that traced Holmes's pop culture impact by looking at the illustrators who had created some of the images that we recognize today. Things like the um, Deerstalker cap, that was uh, not something that Arthur Conan Doyle originally wrote, and the uh, big curved pipe, uh, that actually most likely comes from William Gillette, an actor who played Sherlock Holmes in the early uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. The last chapter was a selected bibliography of major Holmes editions, and it was essentially a catalog of Vincent Starrett's collection. So we know very, very, uh, we know a great deal about what it was that he owned by 1933. For generations, this chapter served as a guide for serious Holmes book collectors, and Starrett became their patron saint. There's one particular paragraph in Private Life that's worth quoting in full here. You can hear the poet in Vincent Starrett coming through. But there could be no grave for Sherlock Holmes or Watson. Shall they not always live in Baker Street? Are they not there this instant, as one writes? Outside, the hansoms rattle through the rain, and Moriarty plans his latest devilry. Within the sea, within the sea coal flames upon the hearth, and Holmes and Watson take their well won ease. So they still live for all that love them well, in a romantic chamber of the heart, in a nostalgic country of the mind where it is always 1895. Starrett hoped he had written a classic, a book that would be every bit as popular as the Sherlock Holmes stories themselves. And while the book had some considerable success, it after all had a second printing in the United States in 1934, and there was a British edition that same year, it slowly slipped from the shelves. This was after all the height of the Great Depression, a time when paying the rent money and putting food on the table was a daily challenge for many and books were an unthinkable luxury. But then a curious thing happened. Christopher Morley, a New York writer, sent a letter to Starrett praising the book and inviting him to attend the first official meeting of a group Morley called the Baker Street Irregulars. Morley and Starrett became fast friends, kin spirits, which showed the power of Sherlock Holmes to build bridges. They shared a love of good books, tobacco, and decent booze. Remember, it was prohibition at that time, so the booze wasn't that great. Still, they were different in so many other ways. Morley was a Rhodes Scholar and a classically educated writer. Starrett didn't finish high school and was a self-educated polymath. Yet their close friendship, made fast by their shared love of Sherlock Holmes, remained strong for the better part of three decades until Morley's death in 1957. The private life of Sherlock Holmes was instrumental in bringing others from around the country into what was the beginnings of the Sherlock Holmes movement, what we would today call a fandom. 
Besides the Morley collection, the most important link was no doubt that of a vice president of General Motors named Edgar W. Smith. Smith wrote to Sterrett to compliment him about the book and then began picking apart some of Sterrett's theories in favor of his own. Sterrett told Smith to look up Morley and the troika was complete. These three men would be the heart and soul of the Sherlock Holmes movement, Sherlock Holmes movement in the United States for 30 years. Again, all because of Vincent Sterrett's one book. So far, we've looked at two crucial contributions by Sterrett, a short story and a book of essays. There's one last major contribution that I want to briefly highlight. Even as the Sherlock Holmes movement was gathering steam in the 1930s and 40s, major changes were taking place in Sterrett's life. His career as a mystery detective writer was floundering as the hard-boiled school took over the space his cool, rationative detectives once held. Sterrett needed a new career. He had always written about his love for books and collecting, and it was no surprise when he reinvented himself as a book columnist for the Chicago newspapers, naming his column Books Alive. These changes in Sterrett's career seemed minor when compared with the outbreak of war in Europe. The news that London was the target of a German blitz in the early 1940s was particularly troubling. Sterrett had visited London and walked up and down Baker Street, imagining which one of these homes had once been 221B, the residence of Sherlock Holmes. Now whole blocks of Baker Street were burned husks, and Western civilization itself seemed on the edge of going up in flames. To deal with his fear and sadness, Sterrett put a sheet of paper in his typewriter and wrote a sonnet to a fading age. Here dwell together still two men of note who never lived and so can never die. How very near they seem, yet how remote that age before the world went all awry. But still the game's afoot for those with ears attuned to catch the distant view halloo. England is England yet for all our fears. Only those things the heart believes are true. A yellow fog swirls past the window pane as night descends upon this fabled street. A lonely hansom splashes through the rain. The ghostly gas lamps fail at 20 feet. Here, though the world explode, these two survive, and it is always 1895. That was Starrett reading his own poem. In less than 100 words, he summed up the hope and joy that we feel from the eternal nature of the Holmes mysteries and the equally endless friendship between Holmes and Watson. Speaking of friendship, um, I want to end with a brief anecdote. It involves Dr. Logan Clendenning, a Kansas City physician, writer, and Sherlockian. Here's their story as Sterrett told it in his memoir, Born in a Bookshop. Quote, once more, when financial disaster threatened, I was obliged to sell some of my books. I had brought together perhaps the finest collection of Sherlockiana in the world, which I prized above gold and rubies, but when the rug came, it had to go. I was pretty sick about this catastrophe, and for a time, I thought I would never collect books again. Then a beautiful thing happened. My loss had been well publicized by the appearance of Scribner's fine catalog of my collection, and one other collector, at least, knew how I was feeling about it. Inspired by my enthusiasm, Dr. Logan Clendenning had been making a Sherlock collection of his own, and one day I received a letter from him. It was a casual sort of letter. It said in effect, my dear boy, I find that I am not getting as much fun out of my Holmes collection as I had anticipated. I hear that you have just parted with your own collection, and I think you ought to start another. Why not start with mine? It is small but goodish. It contains a number of the better pieces that you might have difficulty duplicating, and I am boxing it up this afternoon and getting it off to you tomorrow morning. You will really take a load off my mind if you will accept it. Sterrett goes on to say, it is unnecessary to underscore the generosity of the gift or of the doctor's fellow feeling. I suppose no finer thing is ever done for one collector by another. The box contains some 20 of the most desirable items in the field, including the desperately rare first printing of A Study in Scarlet, the first Sherlock Holmes story. It was the nucleus of a new collection, and touched and overwhelmed by his gift, I began collecting anew. 
Charles Vincent Emerson Starrett died on January 5th, 1974 at the age of 86. He was buried in Chicago's Graceland Cemetery. He was near penniless when he died and his grave only had a small marker for many years. In 1986, to mark the 100th anniversary of his birth, a headstone was placed on the grave, paid for by his friends and admirers. The stone has an image of an open book at its top. On the left page is one of Starrett's book plates and the words, The Last Bookman. And on the right is Starrett's Sherlockian book plate and the inscription, and it is always 1895. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody should unmute himself, and I imagine that um, we'll have some question and answers here from Ray. Hey, Ray, I wanted to ask you, did um, Doyle and Starrett ever actually meet each other at any point? Yes. Uh, so when uh, Starrett was a newspaper reporter, Conan Doyle was doing one of his tours of North America. If you know anything about Arthur Conan Doyle, you may be aware that during the last 15, 20 years of his life, he became a very big advocate for spiritualism, the belief that you could contact the dead through use of, of spiritualists and mediums. Uh, he was on a tour of the United States going around trying to popularize this idea. Starrett uh, had a chance to interview him, tried to talk to him about Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle really didn't want to talk about Sherlock Holmes. He wanted to talk about spirits. So um, there, there was a brief period of time when they did talk. When uh, Vincent Starrett wrote, uh, wrote uh, The Unique Hamlet, he sent a copy of The Unique Hamlet to Arthur Conan Doyle. It was 1920, remembers Conan Doyle didn't die until 1930. Conan Doyle wrote him back and said, thank you very much for it. it Ray, Ray, you froze up there. Well, Doyle was working hard to uh, to to put some kind of legacy that was non Sherlockian, but that didn't work out too well for him. But I think in the end, it, it worked out the way it should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, um, I think Conan Doyle and Sherlock and, and Vincent Starrett share one thing, and that is, both of them wrote a lot during the course of their lifetime but both of them are really only known for their Sherlock Holmes works today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ray, I have a question uh, from somebody that, um, I, if I can find it again. Damn it, where did those uh, questions go? <laughs> it was right on my screen, now it's missing. All right, there it is. Uh, is the film, this is from, um, from uh, Tara. Is the film Private Life of Sherlock Holmes based on the book? And if so, is it co closely based? No. Um, Billy Wilder came, uh, borrowed the title. Uh, they paid Vincent Starrett $100, although they didn't have to pay him anything. Uh, they mostly paid him $100 so that he wouldn't sue them. Uh, you know, titles cannot be copyrighted. Uh, I could go out and write The Grapes of Wrath tomorrow. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, uh, Steinbeck and State might come after me, but quite frankly, um, they, they, they can't stop me. Um, the book is has nothing to do, not no relationship to uh, Starrett's private life of Sherlock Holmes. Um, it's an interesting film in that it, it, it's kind of three different stories munged together into one film. Um, if you haven't seen it lately, um, go take a look at it. Um, Starrett wasn't, uh, Starrett was still alive when it, when it came out. He was not a fan. Uh, he believed that uh, Basil Rathbone was the, uh, was the best uh, actor who ever played Sherlock Holmes. He and Rathbone knew each other. Uh, they uh, corresponded with one another. They spent uh, time with one another. Uh, Rathbone, during the, the last years of his life, uh, did a college uh, speaking tour where he would read Shakespeare and he would read uh, from other plays. He would end his reading by reading uh, 221B, the poem that you heard Vincent Starrett read uh, this evening. Gary, did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. Actually, you anticipated my question. I was going to ask you about <laughs> Starrett's reaction, particularly to Rathbone and to, to Sherlock films and uh, uh, 
Did he write about right. them? Did he uh, so, comment um, on them? Yes, he, he did considerably. Uh, there's a uh, <coughs> uh, 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 silent of John Barrymore as Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. uh, Vincent Sarah believed that Fatty Arbuckle would have played a better Sherlock Holmes <laughs> than, um, than uh, Barrymore did. Uh, he didn't like it at all. Uh, he thought that William Gillette, who uh, was a stage actor, a very, very popular stage actor uh, uh, of his time, uh, was the best uh, Sherlock Holmes <laughs> on stage. And later he thought Basil Rathbone nailed it, um, uh, especially in the first two uh, Rathbone films that had Rathbone in Victorian era. Um, not, you know, fighting the, the, not fighting the Nazis. Not fighting the Nazis. Well, yeah. remember, you know, the war was going on uh, <laughs> and there was there was an effort to try to build American mm -hmm. uh, support for American participation in the war. And so Sherlock Holmes became one of the many kind of characters who, who wound up supporting uh, America's involvement with the war. Yes, Carl. Yeah, speaking of um, tele uh, movies, about the two television um, productions, the PBS and I think it was CBS had one with um, the English actor and I can't think of his name. Right. So um, there, there have been several. The, uh, the one that um, was enormously popular in the 1980s was produced by uh, Granada Television, starring Jeremy Brett as Sherlock Holmes. Um, it kept the characters in period uh, and were very faithful adaptations of the original stories by Dr. Watson. Um, it was, um, uh, they wanted to do all 60 of the original stories. Unfortunately, uh, Jeremy became ill and passed away before they, they could do that. Uh, there have been two uh, very popular modern adaptations, one called Elementary starring uh, Johnny Miller on CBS. Um, and the second was, uh, was called um, uh, Sherlock and it was produced by BBC. Both are modern versions of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Both have their advocates and both have people who don't like them at all. So, uh, you know, uh, if you ever want to go and uh, start a, 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 a debate, uh, go to a bar where there are a bunch of Sherlock Holmes nuts and say, I think the best Sherlock Holmes is blank. And pretty much that's all you have to say for the rest of the evening. It's 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 a free for all, uh, and there's there are a lot of uh, very passionate folks out there. Uh, it's a lot of fun um, to to um, to hear them talk. And um, Tara again uh, asked a question through chat: Was Doyle published uh, right away, and uh, did the publishing company stay the same during his lifetime? Um, I'm not sure exactly. What that means was was Doyle published right away? Yeah. Um, when he published, did it take him a long time to find a publisher for Sherlock Holmes? Or uh, yes. Um, so the first uh, novel that he wrote was called A Study in Scarlet. Um, if the he had to sell the rights for twenty five pounds. If it doesn't sound like much, it didn't sound like much to him either. Um, but it was the only uh, for, person he could find who who wanted it. And uh, it found it found a home in a, in a publication called Beaton's Christmas Annual. If you've never heard of it, there's a good reason because it's no no one's ever heard of it. Uh, Mrs. Beaton was a um, uh, was a, was a, there was an original Mrs. Beaton, but I, even after her death, her husband carried on in the name, and she did cookbooks and, and all kinds of kind of uh, mostly women's literature. Um, so it wound up in in their Christmas magazine and is, was largely forgotten. Uh, the second uh, was um, uh, The Sign of the Four, and that was published by Lippincott's here in the United States and McClure's in, in England. Um, it was also not terribly popular. It wasn't until um, he started publishing uh, short stories in the Strand magazine that Sherlock Holmes caught on, and he became a phenomenon almost overnight. Um, sales of the Strand magazine skyrocketed. He uh, Conan Doyle wrote the, the first set, which we now think of as the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and then he wanted to put that aside because he wanted to do more serious writing. Uh, the Strand magazine came to him and said, we'll give you a lot of money. Conan Doyle's mother, who was very influential in his life at that time, said, you're a fool if you don't take the money. And so he took the money and he wrote the second set, which we think of as the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. And at the end of that, he created Professor Moriarty and he killed off Sherlock Holmes. They went off the Reichenbach Falls. <laughs> No more Sherlock Holmes. He was free to write whatever he wanted. 
except he came up with an idea. Uh, he heard a, a, a friend of his, Fletcher Robinson, told him a story about um, ghost hounds who haunted Dartmoor. And he started writing it without Sherlock Holmes in it, scrapped that version, brought Sherlock Holmes back. But Dr. Watson made it clear this was a story that took place before Holmes's death. Um, another several years were to go by, or the early 1900s, the Strand Magazine basically backed a dump truck of money up to his house and said, we will give this to you if you will write more Sherlock Holmes stories. And he, he relented. He wrote Sherlock Holmes stories until just three years before his death. Those that came after Sherlock Holmes's resurrection, if you will, are generally considered to be not as strong as those from earlier times. Um, again, a lot of debate about that. If you ever want to get into a good fight, go into a bar and raise that among Sherlockians. We spend a lot of time in bars, by the way. I was going to ask, which bar do you go to? This is a place that we should all visit. <laughs> the, answer, the answer, Kurt, is yes. Yes. Yes, we go to the mall. Yes. I've got a question for you. A couple of them. Starrett, you know, he wrote a lot of different genres, mysteries, essays, poetry. You, you probably know him better than, than most just through all your, your research and everything. Did he have a preferred, I mean, was, was there something he preferred more over the others or as a writer? Or? He thought of himself as a, per, a poet first and last. Um, and the fact that um, his poetry was not very popular was difficult for him. But you have to remember, for example, his contemporary, a friend of his, a fellow newspaper reporter of his, was a guy by the name of Carl Sandburg. And for some reason, Sandburg got all the attention in Chicago when it <laughs> came to poetry, and Starrett didn't get any of it. He once showed his uh, poetry to uh, Sandburg to get uh, his opinion, and Sandburg looked at it and was quiet for a few minutes, and then he handed it back to Starrett and, and, and said, put a little guts in it. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, it, it was it was not. Starrett was very much a romantic writer. Uh, he was a he was a romantic poet, and uh, that wasn't popular during the uh, the Chicago literary renaissance of the time when they were breaking down all those rules of what it was you could write about and couldn't write about. And uh, he he liked the rules. He 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 thought they were good, and he wanted to abide by them. So he but not wasn't very popular. The one book that he hoped would be remembered. Um, is a book that almost no one reads today. It's called Seaports in the Moon. It's a it's a fantasy book. Um, you remember that that room that he he talks about so lovingly uh, in his grandfather's bookshop in 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 Toronto. Um, that's where he first read Don, Qu Don Quixote and where he first read about uh, you know Christopher Columbus. And so these the literary characters, uh, D'Artagnan and and others, and and the real life characters blended in his brain. And this story uh, does that. He takes literary characters and he takes the real life folks and he puts them together into a story about the fountain of youth. And uh, the, the, they're, they're essentially a series of, of, um, of short stories uh, about a, a vial of water from the fountain of youth and how it travels throughout the centuries and ends up, of course, the property of a bookseller in Chicago in contemporary times. Mm -hmm. um, he 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 loved, you know. He wrote he wrote new adventures of Long John Silver and new adventures of Don Quixote and new adventures of D'Artagnan and new adventures of Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so all of his all of his childhood favorites, and um, he was writing his own kind of sequels uh, to them. Um, Poe was a particular. Uh, uh, object of his uh, affection. Um, do you want to hear about how he didn't, he got, a, he missed a Tamerlane by this much? Do you know where Tamerlane sure. is? Does anybody know what Tamerlane is? I, I can imagine sure. everybody else knows Tamerlane. So it's, it's, you know, one of the most famous books uh, uh, published in, in this country um, in the early 19 teens and 20s. Tamerlane, there, there were a handful of them um, and Starrett wanted one. Well, he knew that if he walked around to Chicago bookshops, he would never find one, you know, unless someone carelessly tossed one into a bargain bin out in front of the shop. If someone actually had a copy of Tamerlane, it would be so expensive, he would never be able to afford it. So he decided instead of hunting for it himself, he would get all of America to go out and search for a Tamerlane for him. He wrote an article for the Saturday Evening uh, Post, and it was called, Have You a Tamerlane in Your Attic? He described this book. 
He described it in detail. He described why it was important. And he told people, if you get a copy, it's worth thousands of dollars. Well, it worked too well. He started getting hundreds of letters from people who had old copies of poems, you know, a book of poems by, by Edgar Allan Poe, and they were sure that they had a copy of Tamerlane. And he had to write each one of them back and say, no, that's actually not what I'm looking for, because if it says Edgar Allan Poe in it, it's not Tamerlane, because this book was by a Bostonian and not it didn't have Poe's name in it. Except for one woman, Miss Ada Dodd, outside of Boston, went up into her family attic and pulled out a copy of Tamerlane. She wrote Starrett a letter, but she started to get nervous. She contacted a book dealer in Boston who went up, looked at it, and by God, she had a real copy of Tamerlane. He negotiated a price, he bought it from her, and he left. 30 minutes later, the mailman came. Here's a letter from Vincent Starrett. He was mm. writing back to her. He missed the Tamerlane by 30 minutes. Mm. It was one of the great, it's one of the great book stories in the world. You could find it and read. That story has been told over and over again. It gets better with every retelling. Um, Charles Goodspeed wrote about it in his book about collecting. Um, um, uh, Rebecca Rigo Barry uh, has it in 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 her uh, one of her recent books. Um, it's it's you know it's it's like oh my god I just barely missed it. So if you ever feel like you've missed if you've missed a bargain somewhere if you you know have you ever walked into a shop and, and I, this you know happens to me um, you walk you walk into a bookstore and, and and you say yeah do you have anything by Vincent Starrett oh yeah you know. You see that uh, empty space over there on the shelf? I had a bunch of Starrett stuff back there, and somebody came in and bought it all two days ago. You know, if you'd come in just two days earlier, I would have sold it to you, but I'm uh, sorry, it's all gone now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It looks like you got your share, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm curious. Uh, tell us a story, just a brief one, of some, a fun acquisition that you found, one of your favorite acquisitions that was maybe a surprise or serendipitous or something you found scout scouting or okay hang on I, I, let me, i'll be right back okay. <laughs> it's funny on the plane over to england last week i was reading yankee bookseller which is oh, Charles yeah. Goodspeed's book. Good and I just Good read Speed. that story, Ray, just yeah. before you told us about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, I, what, it, it, and that's that's exactly how he tells it too. And he loves telling it because he got the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is this is that book that I was telling you about earlier. It's called Seaports in the Moon, um, and it's a um, it's mm -hmm. uh, it you know you can you can find copies of it out there. There are a lot of them out there. Um, this one was uh, inscribed by Starrett to um, uh, Ames Williams. And the joke among Starrett's uh, collectors is uh, it, you have to find the rare uninscribed copies because Starrett signed absolutely everything. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, finding one without a Starrett signature on it is, is actually rare. This one is intriguing because, um, yeah, you can see that. He actually wrote an alternative ending to the book. Oh. here um i've never seen that in any other copy i've never seen it in any other copy of his book but apparently he didn't like the the ending that um, you know that he had written originally and this was done in 1943 so it was done about uh, 15 years after the book was published and so he wrote another ending to williams um and it's absolutely delightful and um i didn't I, you know i opened it up i saw that it was inscribed I bought it based on the inscription because Ames Williams was um, another uh, uh, Stephen Crane um, uh, 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 collector and Starrett had done a bibliography of Crane. The two of them uh, combined their efforts 20 years later and, and did a much bigger and, and better bibliography of Crane. Uh, so it, it, it has that nice uh, Starrett connection associated with it. Um, but it wasn't until I uh, opened up the back of it and realized that it, it actually has um, uh, an alternative ending to it, which is pretty cool. Uh, wow. 
has me. Yeah. Yes, Carl. Um, you you mentioned that uh, he started um, quit school, high school. Uh, what was going on in his life that he didn't complete schooling? He was bored. Um, he didn't like school. You know, the only the only classes he liked were, were you know literature and writing. Um, he didn't like. He especially hated math. And the fact that he went broke so many times, uh, there may be some relationship there. Um, he he um, he he was he was bored, and he wanted to go out and have an adventure, and so he did. Um, Armor Meat Packing Company was a big uh, in, uh, or, um, business in Chicago in those days, and Starrett learned that you could get free passage to London on one of their ships if you worked uh, the ship. So um, he uh, spent uh, two weeks um, uh, feeding, feeding cattle and then shoveling what came out the other end. Uh, and that is how he earned his way to London. Um, he, he got there and um, he was broke. There was broke a lot in his life, um, but he, he was in London. He didn't care. Uh, he spent uh, two or three days, frankly, on the streets starving until he made it to the Salvation Army uh, uh, home. And uh, they ran a hotel uh, for sailors in those days. And he went there and, and um, in, in return for room and board, he would go out with the Salvation Army band and sing. His mother was a deeply religious woman and uh, he had learned a lot of the hymns, Christian hymns uh, from, from uh, her. And so he, um, he went out and um, uh, marched up and down the streets of London uh, for a couple of weeks, and that's how he saw London, uh, was with the Salvation Army Band. Um, he did his passage back, uh, again, shoveling after cows. Um, uh, he went back to London a couple of more times, but um, he, um, uh, he never... Um, um, he, he never finished high school. He never went to college. Um, and you know he was, but he was a polymath. He 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 read extraordinarily widely and deeply, so he could carry on a conversation with any college professor and not be terribly embarrassed by his lack of knowledge. He also was a journalist for a long time, and that how he paid the bills. He started out that way, right, Kurt? Um, so in the um, um, he, he started out with the Chicago Inner Ocean uh, newspaper that. Um, faded um, during his first couple of years and uh, switched over to the Daily News. And he was a Daily News reporter when Ben Hecht was a Daily News reporter, when Carl Sandburg was a reporter, when uh, Harry Hansen was a reporter, when Charles MacArthur was a reporter. Um, these people all went on to much bigger careers uh, in their lives. Um, you know, Hecht went on to Hollywood and, and had his fingers in almost every major film that was produced in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s on up into the early 60s. Um, Harry Hansen became a, a, a syndicated columnist whose column ran in newspapers all around the country. He, um, he married. Uh, his first marriage was not successful. Um, he and his wife separated. Um, he, he, he uh, went back to work for a, a weekly newspaper in, um, in Chicago uh, and tried to run a little literary magazine. Um, it had eight issues in total uh, before it folded. Um, and um, he eventually, as I said uh, in my talk, you know, when his, when his um, short stories, mystery short stories, his mystery novels stopped selling, he reinvented himself as a book columnist for the Chicago Tribune. So he spent the last, uh, you know, 30 some years of his life uh, writing for the Chicago Tribune. Yes, sir. Um, Roxanne sent me a, a message here and says that um, there's a fun recent novel in which a rare copy of Timberlane figures, the storied life of A.J. Frickley. It's modern retelling of Silas Marner a bookseller is hoarding a secret copy of Tamerlane, which disappears. It stands in for Sellers' hoard of gold. Are you familiar mm. with that? No, I haven't read it. Thank you for letting me know about it. I'll go hunt it up. <laughs> That's Roxanne that uh, sent that in. Very good. Very, very good.
for them. Charles, you, you, you were asking, did I ask something? I was going to ask what happened to his library and his papers. So, um, a, a, you know, a, the remnants of, no, remnants, a lot of it is at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I'm hoping to go up there over the course of the summer to do some research uh, in, into some of the questions that I've uh, come up with over the years. Um, that, that, that's where a lot of the manuscripts, letters, and other kinds of things are housed. Um, they are stare at letters to a wide variety of writers. He, he wrote to a lot of writers. Um, and so, um, you know, if you were a writer in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, chances are stare and, and fairly popular, chances are stare wrote to you. There's a long correspondence, for example, between him and, and, and um, Rex Stout. There's, there's correspondence between him and Frederick Danae, who, who was half of Ellery Queen. Um, he, he was, he was quite, quite prolific letter writer and, um, um, he, um, uh, so, so they're scattered all around, but most of his stuff, uh, the, the biggest concentration is at the University of Minnesota library. So they, they came in and evaluated his books, but they were not sold to the trade or bought out or anything. They were. Uh, you know, I have to go back to Otto and Peter and ask them more about that. Um, that's about a part. Of, that's a part of his life that I just don't know very much about. And what happened after he died mm. um, to to his collection? Um, you know, there there there's a writer by the name of of uh, Peter Ruber who put out a book called The Last Bookman. Um, you talk to some people and they say Peter Ruber was stealing books uh, from from Vincent Sterrett uh, late in his life. Others say, no, Sterrett turned to him and said, oh, you like that book? Go ahead here, take it. Well, Sterrett also uh, sold a number of collections over the years. He had to sell because he ran out of money. So he formed multiple collections. So there are a lot of his books out there. Yeah, that are legit. Yeah, yeah, Kurt, Kurt, that's absolutely correct. And, and um, you know, there, there were at least three major sales during the course of his lifetime. Um, and, you know, he sold off one collection, his, his um, Arthur Bacon collection, he sold that off uh, to raise money for Lillian, his first wife, uh, after the two of them separated. He sold off uh, that other big chunk, as, as, you, as you know. Um, uh, it's, it's really a sad story. His second wife, uh, Rachel, um, had um, mental issues, uh, emotional issues. Um, Rachel was institutionalized a number of times. And, um, you know, in those days, there was no insurance to pay for these kinds of things. So he had to sell off books to help pay for her care. It's one of the reasons why he only went to New York once for a meeting of the Baker Street Irregulars, despite the fact that he was a founding member of the group. Um, if uh, Rachel was at home with him, he couldn't leave her um, mm -hmm. because she would uh, become so upset with, with, with his leaving. Uh, she worried that he would never come back. Um, and then there, you know, there were times when he just couldn't afford a train ticket uh, back and forth from Chicago to New York and, and the hotel stay while he was there. Yes, One more question. What about uh, you, Ray? Uh, when did you get started? Um, was, were you a Sherlockian before you were a Starrette? And why Starrette as opposed to any other uh, Sherlockian? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, part of it is because, as as you heard earlier, um, *Private Life of Sherlock Holmes* was kind of the first book that introduced me to the idea that there are these group of people out there who are very playful in in how they treat the Sherlock Holmes stories. As um, uh, my old friend John Bennett Shaw used to say, "There's a very thin line between fiction and reality when it comes to Sherlock Holmes, and we're here to erase the line." Um, it's a uh, uh, it's it's a very playful way to kind of use your brain and, and your history. I, I think part of it is also due to the fact that I was a newspaper reporter. That was my first career. Starrett was a newspaper reporter, so I had some kind of empathy for for the life that he was going through. Um, and I just found him to be an endlessly fascinating character. Um, he um, he there, there are levels and depths to him that um, uh, that I keep uncovering uh, the more that I go. Um, and the the extent of of the 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 literature that that he was involved in at various points during the course of his life, it's it it's almost endless. Um, and uh, so you know, 
Um, you can go out and spend quite a bit of money. My wife is in the next room. I've not done that, by the way. I've not spent quite a bit of money out collecting Vince Astaire stuff. You hear that, dear? Thank you. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and, you know, um, almost all these things were free. And uh, they, you know, it's, it's, um, so it, it gave, I knew I was never going to have a first class Sherlock Holmes collection, you know, going and finding a Beaton's Christmas annual, going and finding all of these, these stories in their first appearances was way beyond my checkbook. But in the 1980s, 90s and aughts, there weren't a lot of people out there collecting Vincent Sterrett stuff. So you could find a lot of these things at, you know, reasonable prices. And so it was easier to collect Sterrett and uh, than it was uh, financially uh, feasible to collect Sherlock Holmes. What about the uh, eight or nine uh, editions of the literary magazine Starrett published? Do you have copies of those? I have most of them. Um, they were, they were, <laughs> so they, uh, so he was, he was sitting in his office, uh, not working uh, back in the days when he was working on this uh, weekly uh, newspaper. And um, he, uh, a, a printer came in uh for, for who was has swedish background and the the printer wanted to start um a magazine that would be able to show off uh some of the uh, artwork that he was and other and others were doing starrett wanted a little literary magazine because he wanted to be known as as the editor of a little literary magazine so put their desires together um and and they're off and uh starrett starts uh, publishing um works by friends of his uh he, he published a uh, a play that uh, ben hecht wrote uh and, and hecht had given him the manuscript many years before when they were newspaper reporters well hecht never wanted that to be published and he was very angry that starrett published it so he starrett had to write a public uh, uh apology for it um the you would think that a, a printer uh a, 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 a or an artist would would want really good paper for for their for their magazine it was published on very cheap paper. They fall apart as you look at it. Um, copies are really hard to come by. And when you do find them, they're often in pieces. Um, I have about, you know, I, I think I have um, six of the eight. Uh, trying to find someone who has all eight, it, it, they're, they're, not, they're not very common anymore because most of them just disappeared. Ray, I'm curious. Uh... In terms of the Starrett books that you own, I'm sure you've got some. Have you ever been able to acquire any that were Sherlock Holmes related? Any favorites of Starrett's own copies that you've encountered? No, I I, I don't. Um, those generally go for prices that um, you know um, are equal to you know mortgage payments, and I I don't I don't go quite that. We far. don't want to hear any excuses now. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a couple of of, of the books uh, that uh, code that of, of Conan Doyle's works that were uh, non Sherlockian uh, that that Starrett owned uh, during the course of his lifetime, but none of his Sherlock Holmes books. Uh, those, um, uh, you know, there were collectors like Peter Blau and Glenn Maranker and, and a couple of others uh, who yeah. have tremendous resources. And you know, God bless them. They're, they 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 pull this stuff together. Um, it's a bit of a downer, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you one more story before before we end, because it's it's the, the kind of story that I think book collectors might enjoy. So hang on a second. I need to pull something off the shelf. So um, Sterling wanted to always be known as a poet and um, his first book of poetry was called Banners in the Dawn. And um, it's, it, poetry is very uh, Victorian. I mean, he was born in the Victorian era, so it, it has a very Victorian style to it. Um, his father died in 1917, but his mother was alive when uh, the, the, poet, the book was published. And um, he wasn't quite sure how his mother would react to the poetry. She had always, uh, she liked poetry. She um, uh, had encouraged him in in poetry but again she was a deeply christian woman who had very strict values and and sense of propriety um and so um when i was uh we, we my wife and i had done a a, a two-week uh, trip in alaska and we wound up in vancouver and I, I went to a bookstore in vancouver and i went into the bookstore 
and it was one of those bookstores that I love, you know, books falling off the shelves. You can't walk through the aisles because there are so many books stacked around you. Um, and it, it's just a mess. And I love kind of going through all of that. And after about an hour and a half in the mess, uh, I went up to the owner and I said, look, do you have anything by Vincent Starr? He said, yeah, I think I've got something somewhere. Uh, wait a minute. Let me let me look around. And, you know, he looks at the same places that I've been looking. He doesn't find anything. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I, I got a bunch of stuff over in storage next door. Wait, I'll, I'll be back. And he goes, runs away and he comes back and says, no, I can't find it anywhere. So I leave him my card and I walk out. And as I'm walking down the hill, he comes after me and he's waving a book. He said, wait, 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 Mr. Bester, wait, wait, wait. I have something here for you. And it's a copy of Banners and the Dawn. As you can see, it's kind of chewed up and, and it's not in very good shape. And I had a couple of copies by that point. I had a couple of copies that had been inscribed by Starrett on that point. He said, yes, but do you have the copy he inscribed to his mother? Okay. Oh. <laughs> and here it is. Dear mother, I hope you will find much to applaud and little to disapprove of in this, my first collection of uh, poetry. Love to you at Christmas. Charlie, because his name was Charles Vincent Emerson Starrett, and his family knew him as Charlie, 1922. So that's that's the inscription. So I, we, we negotiated a price, and I walked away with it. I think my feet touched the ground. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but as I was walking out of the shop, he called after me, and he said, wait a minute. You've got a mystery you need to solve. I said, what's that? He said, what's that book doing in Vancouver? Family always lived in Chicago. Well, you know, I mean, you, you come up with all kinds of reasons for it. Yeah. But I did a little research. It turned out that his mother, in the last couple of years of her life, went with a group of um, fellow, fellow Christians from Chicago to proselytize to the first people uh, who lived in the uh, Vancouver area, to the, to the Native Canadians there. Um, and in 1933, while riding a ferry boat, she committed suicide. Oh, my. Hmm. Oh. She had that book with her among her things. And a cousin of hers who was living in Vancouver at the time claimed her possessions. And that's how that book wound up in Vancouver. Do you know why um, she committed suicide? You know, Starrett, again, he, he, he didn't have the deep religious faith that his mother had, but he, uh, and he never mentioned, by the way, her suicide uh, in print. He was interviewed by uh, Peter Ruber late in his life, and Ruber says that, um, uh, Starrett grew a little sad and said, you know, I've always thought my mother looked out on the water and she saw her Lord and Savior walking on the water and she went out to greet him. Mm. Maybe she was ill or something, had a, had a terminal disease or something, cancer or something. Who knows? Who mm. knows? Um, there, there are some folks uh, in the Starrett family and, and it's now, so Starrett never had any children, so it's, you know, it's the 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 descendants of brother his his brother's children's family so they're you know several several removed there's some who believe that she you know she she fell overboard they don't simply can't believe that a christian woman would have committed suicide um who knows who knows i have one more uh, question uh, ray uh, yeah, <clears throat> we had a member years ago who's now past uh, Arthur Walker, he was a very big Shalak Shalakian. Did you were you familiar with him or Arthur Walker? Yeah. A -K -E? Walker. No. Yeah. yeah. No. I'm sorry. I don't. No. Right. I, I did not. I was I'm just sorry. curious. But he he yeah. he had built a a model of twenty one. What is it? Two twenty one. Twenty one B. Yeah, and yeah. he put that in and gave a big talk about it. Was he was great? Oh, that's great. He loved Sher Sherlock. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Irene, I think you had your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really enjoyed oh. this. I, I learned a lot, and I want to know: is there any uh, particular book that you would like to find that you ha do not have at this time? Um. You know, I, 
I, well, Tamerlane, um, and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, do. yeah, that'll do. Uh, and, you know, um, I, I have most of the, um, Vincent Starrett books that I am aware of that, that I know that are out there. But, you know, every once in a while, something pops up like this copy of Seaports in the Moon that's just um, uh, incredible. So n there's nothing that I'm actually kind of actually searching for. Um, but that doesn't mean that I still don't look, um, you know, every once in a while. That doesn't mean that I'm still not out there um, looking at catalogs and, and online and, and um you know, when I still find open shops, God bless them. I, I will still go through them. There aren't there aren't many anymore, but yeah, I still still enjoy walking in and uh, asking people if they if they have anything by Vincent Starrett. You never know. You just never know. Well, I'll keep my eye. <laughs> Please do. Please do. Please do. And um, so, it my blog is www.vincentstarrett.com. Um, I've been running it now for six or seven years. Um, unfortunately, there's no decent search function for the blog, so you have to kind of play around with it a little bit and roam around uh, in there. Um, the last blog entry is uh, about his, um, his uh, uh, relationship with Arthur uh, Macon, uh, or Mocken. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Does anybody know him? He was a Welsh uh, writer and uh, a poet uh, around the turn of the century. Um, Sterrett was a huge fan of his, promoted his work here in the United States, wrote to Machen, became a very uh, uh, close uh, correspondent with him, uh, published uh, with Machen's uh, apparent consent two books of, of essays by Machen that had not been published in the United States up to that point. Machen had then signed a contract with Knopf and Knopf basically said, you've got to stop that guy from, from, from printing your stuff. You're exclusive with us. And so Machen wrote a, a letter to the press that denounced Sterrett and Sterrett felt betrayed uh, after going around and spending a lot of time promoting uh, this writer. Um, and so it's, it's about kind of the story of their friendship and how it, it broke up and um, how Starrett became very disillusioned. It's also a story about his naivete uh, in, in being a, a, pub, a, you know, a publisher. Um, he, it was a role for which he was not suited. Where do you live, Ray? Where, where are you at? Uh, so we just moved uh, nine months ago. I, I lived um, in Pennsylvania for a fair period of time, but I'm living in Williamsburg, Virginia now, the colonial capital of Virginia, if okay. any of you uh come up and uh you know want to go wandering around in tricorn hats and and playing drums <laughs> and uh, marching up and down the streets of, of colonial williamsburg please let me know i know where all the best uh breweries and distilleries are in town sure. sounds good well are there are there any more questions thank you so so much i cannot tell you how much i've been looking forward to this and how much i've i've enjoyed it um it, it's it has been really a delight for me um and and i hope you've uh, had a good time thank you so much for your questions too it's, yeah. it's a lot of fun Ray, it's been delightful thank you so much thanks for all the hard work that you put into the presentation and thank your wife also for listening to it so many times while you rehearsed it <laughs> <laughs> She's learned how to tune me out after 43 years of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> That's a skill too, right? Yes. Well, thank you very much. And um, with that, we will say good night. Good night. Thank you, Chuggy. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you. And Carl and Charles. <laughs>